Today's program is part of the Profiles in Literature series, featuring interviews with persons prominent in American literature for children. The moderator of this series is Dr. Jacqueline Schachter Weiss. Today's guest from Brooklyn is Paula Fox, prize-winning author of books for young people and adults. Welcome to Profiles in Literature. Joining me is my Profiles colleague, Carolyn Field, Coordinator Emeritus of the Office and Work with Children of the Free Library of Philadelphia and 1986-87 U.S. Section President of the International Board on Books for Young People. Thank you, Jackie. It's great to see you again, Paula. Thank you. We've known each other a long time. Indeed we have. And I've always been very proud of your accomplishments. Now's a good time for us to talk about them. Thank you. I would say heading the list was your 1978 receipt of the Hans Christian Andersen Medal for your collected work for children. That medal is given biannually by the International Board on Books for Young People. From the United States, there have only been four Anderson winners, you, Minder DeYoung, and Scott O'Dell as authors, and Maurice Sendak as an illustrator, with you being the only woman <laughs> of the quartet. <laughs> Tell us, please, about your Anderson presentation ceremony, where it occurred, and the highlight for you. Well, it, it was in a wonderful building called the Residence. Uh, and I'm trying to remember the city which it escaped me right at the moment, Wurz, Würzburg. It was Würzburg, about 80 miles from Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. The Residence, although Würzburg had been bombed very severely, the Residence survived and all, most of the rooms had Tiepolo paintings on the ceiling and so forth. It's an extraordinarily beautiful place. And it was like the frozen north uh, that fall because, there, of course, it's a very old palace and has no heating. Uh, and we sat, all of us, uh, who were there for the Anderson ceremony, and listened to speeches, and finally I think everyone became utterly frozen. There was hardly any sign of life. And then onto the stage came a group of young musicians, and they were simply wonderful. They were probably 12 to 15. They played Mozart in this marvelous room, oh. terribly cold, with Tiepolo. <laughs> and, uh, I uh, like very short speeches, and this time I was very lucky to have given one because I think people would have left if it had been longer than a page. And it was really a thank you. And it was quite extraordinary for me. Uh, I was very touched by the young musicians in that particular room with that ceiling. And I think I was so ast astonished by the surroundings that that, that was very... Uh, strong for me where I was and so forth. Sounds very exciting. Yes. Now this was in 1978 when you 1978, got the Anderson yes. Medal mm -hmm. and in 1974 you won the Newbery Medal for the same book, The Slave Dancer, yes. which is your first historical novel. Yes, yes. How, how did you uh, react when you heard about uh, receiving the Newbery Medal? Well it was very scary then because they used to call you uh, at three o'clock in the morning, the Newberry Committee, and it was rather like when the French take somebody to be guillotined, they also come at three o'clock in the morning <laughs> and uh, creep down to the cell. Because if you have children at three o'clock in the morning, phone call is always terrifying. And my children were of an age then when I was very terrified. And uh, in fact, uh, my son answered the phone who was staying with us at the moment. and. Uh, then I heard voices, two or three voices, smiling and sort of giggling on the other end yeah. of the phone. I said, uh, you've won the Newberry. And I said, what? W-H-A. I, I was too sleepy to say what. <laughs> so then I couldn't sleep, and I went down to the kitchen, and we all got up and had tea and toast. And uh, then I was very concerned, because I had to go to Chicago that morning, and I didn't have a proper dress. Oh, yeah. So on the way from the airport in Chicago, I stopped and at Saks in Chicago, and they had a very large black dress, which was much too large, but that was, that was the only thing, so I got it. And then we arrived at the hotel, and nobody would speak to me because I wasn't supposed to know yet. It was all very ritualistic. It was like a Japanese no play. It should have been done silently. <laughs> and uh, 
So then I went to some little room where I changed into the dress and I came into a very large ballroom and again people were not speaking to me except for John Donovan who spoke <laughs> to me. But everyone else when they looked at me turned their back until it was announced that I'd won the Newberry and then everybody <laughs> turned away and looked at me. Of course. So I was, yeah. it was, it was, I was then received back into human society again in my very large black dress. And John Donovan is from the children's book. Yes. Yeah. And uh, then I went back to, uh, in fact, it was, what was interesting was I was teaching at Stony Brook at the time. And when I went in, a colleague said, I see you had a very poor review in the New York Times for the slave dancer. You know how colleagues are sometimes. <laughs> And I had just, it was strange because the review, in fact, was very late in the Times. And uh, it wasn't good review. And it didn't seem to have made much difference. So look who end. got so the last laugh. So you got laugh. the last laugh, yes. Uh -huh. Anyhow, then I went back to work again because the excitement of winning a prize is very quickly over. In fact, it's over a lot more quickly than the sting of a bad review very often, which mm -hmm. is unfortunately mm -hmm. true for most writers. In your Newberry acceptance speech, you said that a footnote and a Newark woman's televised statement at a housing project yes. Yes. influenced yes. your writing of The Slave Dancer. Please give us some details. Well, the, the footnote was in a book called The Middle Passage, uh, I think by a man named Mannix, M-A-N-N-I-X, and it concerned the middle passage, that is from Benin to the Caribbean, sometimes to the coast of Georgia, during the slave trade, uh, which had been outlawed in many parts of the, eastern, of the United States then, but uh, unlike the English, we tend to be lawbreakers, so even though it had been outlawed, it continued. And uh, he was writing about it, and he had a footnote in which he said that uh, during the 18th century particularly, before this English outlawed slavery, children, waifs who had been abandoned in London or any large city, who begged on the streets and very often played an instrument, perhaps a fife or a drum, to accompany their begging, were mm -hmm. kidnapped, were shanghaied by slave ship captains. And they were used as cabin boys um, uh, and also to exercise the slaves because during the latter part, I think, of the 18th century, along with lemons for scurvy, it was discovered that if they exercised the slaves, they were in much better condition and therefore would bring more money. They certainly didn't do it out of kindness. Mm -hmm. So uh, these children, if they were musicians, were quite valuable. And they were called slave dancers. Well, I didn't know enough, I felt, about England to have that boy come from there. But I didn't know, I had lived in New Orleans and I had, um, I had a little sense of the South and whatnot. So I, I had him kidnapped in New Orleans. I don't know if a child ever was kidnapped <coughs> that way, but they certainly were in England. The woman you spoke of was very uh, striking to me. I, don't, I can't remember quite when that happened, but I saw on a television newsreel a very indignant looking elderly woman uh, who was picketing, protesting uh, uh, cheap housing being built for black families. Um, she was carrying on a great deal, and she said uh, something so extraordinary. She said, uh, they chose to come over here in ships just as my uh, grandfather and grandmother did. A and it seemed incredible to me that she could have lived her whole life without ever absorbing the information yes. that black people had not uh, chosen to come here, you know. Excellent. And uh, so that was very striking to me. Well, you say that you uh, did live in New Orleans uh, at one yes, time because the uh, slave did. dancer, he comes yes. from there. How about the, the, uh, ver that powerful scene, uh, the shipwreck, uh, when Jesse Bolivar, your yes. main character, is uh, on the slave ship and they have this storm at sea. Have you ever been in a yes, storm I, at I sea? Yes, I was in a terrible storm at sea. And I, it's, it's funny, I, I read a lovely description of fiction by an Irish writer, Jay G. Farrell, who said when asked if he was writing about true things, which is what one is often asked, he said, he said, the bricks are real, but the architecture's invented. Mm -hmm. And in, in this way, I can say that I was indeed in a storm at sea, mm -hmm. but not in 1840. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, I'm not, not quite that old. But uh, I was in a storm at sea in 1945, a uh, very bad storm, mm -hmm. uh, where we hope two for three days and the ship nearly went over a small freighter mm -hmm. I was on. And that uh, that creased my brain, I can tell you. I never forgot that storm. 
So, you know, one puts these things together and that out of one's own life and then which sets off a certain imaginative possibility about other lives, even historical lives. But I don't think I'd want to write another historical book again. Well, speaking of experiences, as you know the uh, Council for Interracial uh, Books for Children mm -hmm. argues that only a black author mm -hmm. has the experiential background mm -hmm. to write about slavery. Now, well, yes, that's, that? yes, and only a, uh, only if somebody who's died in the war has the experiential background to write about dying in the war. I mean, it, that is of such a low intellectual caliber that I wouldn't even speak to it because what it, it's contrary to literature. It has no, it has nothing to do with creative, imaginative fiction. What it has to do with is agit propaganda, right. and that's ideological and political. And and I find them, I find it despicable. So. I feel uh, yes. authors should be encouraged to be imaginative. Few people argue people today, who, yes. for example, that women can't write about mm -hmm. male characters. But and women have been versa. writing about men for centuries. <laughs> I, I mean, know. take George Eliot. <laughs> of course, men <laughs> about women. Oh, George of Eliot. She wouldn't have had a chance now. Of course. Would she have? But I do <laughs> want to ask you, what was your intended primary theme of the slave dancer? Well, I don't think I thought of it that way. You know, when you write it, I think you don't set out thinking I'm going to write about this theme and whatnot. I was very um, moved and taken by the idea of, of a story that would go with that footnote, which set me thinking. I didn't write the book for several years after I saw that footnote. I didn't then rush to the typewriter after I'd read it. Um, it's a very complicated matter. It's, as Thomas Mann said, I don't know what my books are about until critics tell me later, you know. You don't, if you consciously are working at something, it seems to me that the life of the book is in danger because you mm. become self-conscious in the wrong way. I was certainly c concerned and stricken by the idea of slavery, and that's what I wrote it out of. I looked upon the primary theme as the whole known world is splitting apart. Yes, well, that's good, that's good for you. But if I had seen that, I would yeah. have... <laughs> but that's me as a reader. Yeah. Uh, what difficulties did you face writing Terrible. for children about such an adult topic? Well, it was slavery. most of the history. No, I, I didn't find that so difficult, oddly enough. It was the history that was so oh. difficult, because by the time I had read for a year, I was so filled with facts that I was, I was in a certain, I was repressed, <laughs> you know, I was sat upon by history. Yeah. And I had to almost forget a lot that I had been uh, reading. And in fact, at one point I wrote a kerosene lamp and I thought, no, they didn't have them yet. And I was right. Because you, after you've read long enough, you know, primary sources, history and so forth, uh, you become, you've sensitized certain possibilities. Mm -hmm. But it was very difficult to be free enough to write the book after knowing mm -hmm. so much, mm -hmm. you know, so that's being why. so constrained by the stuff, that was the most difficult, and the part about sailing, about which I knew nothing, I see. that was terribly hard, yeah. boating and sailing. <laughs> Again, in your Newberry acceptance speech, you said that you wrote the slave dancer as a uh, never quite to be freed captive of a white childhood in a dark condition. Yes. Please tell us about your parents and childhood. Well, that's too long a story, but I didn't live with my parents most of the time. I lived with my grandmother, and I was brought up the first few years of my life by a minister in, in the Hudson Valley, and then I went to Cuba, where I lived with my grandmother in the plantation. And in fact, I only spent a very short time with either parent, a few days, mm -hmm. a couple of weeks. So, and I moved around a great deal. I was very uh, uneasy about where, where I was going to live next. And uh, so I had a difficult, I had what was known as a, as a rather lurid and difficult childhood. And, um, was your father a writer? Yes, he was. And what, yes. what, kind, what kind of a well, writer? Well, he wrote, he actually, he, he was a playwright. He began as a, oh. he wrote for, Di for the Dial at first. He, when he was 19, he sold a couple of short stories to Mencken and was very thrilled by that. But he was more interested in teaching. Mm -hmm. However, he then began to write uh, plays, and he wrote a couple of plays that, uh, that lasted quite long for that period, which was in the late 20s, and became a play fixer, because he, it was very hard to make a living out of plays. Mm -hmm. He run for years, and they didn't cost what they do now. And he used to, you know, plays that would have a bad time out of town, he and a couple of other people would try to work on them and try to get them into shape to open in New York. And then he went to Hollywood and became a screenwriter and worked for Metro Golden Mayor for some time, and then he went to England and worked for British Galmont. And during that period, I think when he was about 40, um, he began to write 
uh, some books, and he wrote a few novels which were not very successful. Yes. And uh, um, so he had a kind of writer, a certain kind of writing career. From what the time was his he was name? Young. Paul Hervey Fox. Right. Paul your Fox. relationship with your grandmother was important. You treat the grandmother-granddaughter relationship better in your adult books than in the books you've written thus far for children. I don't think I have. I'm trying to think. Do I have grandmothers? In the children's books, I haven't read no, yet. No, I think they're older people, uh -huh. but not grandparents. But uh, um, I wanted to mention, I wanted to really ask you, did you feel toward your own grandmother more like Luisa felt toward Nana Sanchez mm. in A Servant's Tale, more like Clara felt toward Alma Maldonada in The Widow's Children, or in what unique way? Oh, no, in, uh, toward Alma. Mm -hmm. Much more toward Alma. No, the grandmother in uh, Nana in The Servant's Tale was a, very much of an invented granny, ah, very much invented grandmother, and was really more based on uh, people that I knew in Cuba. And of course, so that's an imaginary island that isn't I know. Uh, Cuba. I know. <laughs> in both <laughs> A Servant's Tale and The Widow's Children, you identified with a bathed Caribbean girl who had her hair put up in brown paper twists. Mm. Yes. Briefly, what other memories do you have of your Cuban of Cuba? childhood? Well, an awful lot of it is in the first section of A Servant's Tale. It was a long time ago, but uh, my great aunt had a sugar plantation, and my grandmother and I lived on it. And we left it because there was, in fact, a revolution, a very small revolution, which was a very significant one, because uh, Batista came in, who was then followed by Castro. And, uh, and in fact, the president, while I was there, was assassinated, I believe. My child was assassinated. So we had to leave. But I was there for about two and a half years when I was a child. What, what did you do before you became a full-grown uh, writer? <laughs> oh, my gosh, Caroline. I've had so many jobs. I, I used to think, you remember that program, What's My Line? Oh, yes. The strangest right. job. I've had terrible jobs. The strangest job I ever had was I punctuated some 15th century madrigals because the man who had found them in Italy, uh, who was doing a th PhD thesis on them, didn't want the responsibility for punctuating them because they were unpunctuated. These are written in 1400s. So I got a book of Shakespearean songs. Oh. And, you know, 14th century Italian is very different. 1400s, like English, Middle English, and so forth. And I would just arbitrarily would put commas or semicolons in. And that's what he hired me to do at $2 an hour. <laughs> he didn't want the responsibility for that. So he, that's what I did. But I worked at all kinds of things. I was a re sort of a string girl in Europe for a year, a reporter, very low mm. on the on the ladder, a string girl, stringer. And but uh, training in writing, would it be? I don't think so. No. no, I don't think so. I think you know. I think it was uh, no. It was training in something else. I mean, moving around and taking care of myself and whatnot. And and I was I taught for some years. Mm -hmm. And I taught uh, learning children with very severe learning problems and. Uh, um, English is the second language, too, you taught. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, I did. Mm -hmm. I taught nurses, too. I taught nurses mm -hmm. to speak a little Spanish because so many of their patients were, oh, couldn't, really? couldn't oh. speak uh, English, and it, or doctors. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've had an, uh, a long Ryan. life now, so I've had mm -hmm. an awful lot of jobs. Worked mm -hmm. in factories, I've taught, all kinds of things. What did your husband Martin Greenberg do? Martin Greenberg is a professor of English literature at Long Island University, oh. and he's written, uh, he wrote a book on Coleridge, uh, and a book on uh, the Hamlet vocation, and a book on Kafka called The Terror of Art. And he's now translating some plays of Heinrich von Kleist. And um, let's see, what else can I tell you about him? Does he ever help you in your writing at all? It, well, he's it, a, it, it, no, separate. I do it very privately. I seem to have to do it that way. And then he looks at it when I've finished. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he'll say, I think you need, it's a bit rough. Uh, Oh, those two mm -hmm. chapters or something. But he doesn't say, do this, do that. Does, do your uh, two uh, married sons write at all? No, my younger one, I suspect, would like to. But he's not, I don't know that he does. He is very interested in my books and always was. The older one is not. The younger one used to wait till the page fell out of the typewriter and take and it, it when he was a little kid, you know. Uh, but, and he's still very interested. Uh, but my older son is amused uh -huh. that, you know, his mother does this strange thing, but he doesn't read my books, I don't think. What do they I do? don't press them about. What them. do the boys do? What do they do? Well, uh, uh, my, 
younger son spent a year in Africa and then some time mm -hmm. in China. He's a very good linguist, but he dropped out of school, and he's now a kind of high-tech welder. But I think he may go back to school at some point and finish, because being able to speak and read Chinese is oh, quite something. Good. Marvelous. And uh, he was quite good at it. And the old, my older son, Adam, is a kind of uh, energy expert and works for a very large New Jersey kind of asphalt mm -hmm. company, which he, and he saved, to save them fuel costs and how to use mm -hmm. uh, garbage for energy and all kinds of things like that. Back to you, Paula. Why do you write? Oh, I couldn't, I couldn't possibly answer that. I, I do because I write because I write. That's why. All right. <laughs> you, oh, you write for more than one I publisher. Love stories. So how do you mm -hmm. decide who gets your manuscript? Well, actually, I. That the odd thing is that Richard Jackson has been my editor for all except two books, and I have simply followed him from company to company. Oh, that's ah. interesting. It's not that I've gone to that I've gone to different companies; mm -hmm. is that he's gone and I've and trailed you after him, him along. Except with two children's books, but outside of that, he's published all of my young pe books for young people. The um, I was with Harcourt Brace with three adult novels. Then they fired many people, including my editor and changed all kinds of policy. Then I had a, had a new editor, a wonderful editor who alas died. Oh. So I tend to stay pretty much with the editor I have unless the axe comes along, one kind of axe or another. Well, you know, adults are always interested in how an author and an editor work together. Mm -hmm. How do you work together with your editor? Well, we are editors. Editors, oh, editors. well, basically. actually with, with uh, Richard Jackson, Jackson um, mm -hmm. We leave each other alone very much. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, uh, he's a very good editor because I think he understands one's intention. And he isn't there waiting to spring out and say, uh, uh, to try to interfere or make his mm -hmm. own hand felt in the manuscript. He disappears. That's very important, it seems to me, for an editor. Mm -hmm. um, but he knows what one is up to. He certainly understands what I'm up to. And if it isn't, if it isn't as clear, as he thinks it should be, or as he thinks I would want it to be. He usually seems to understand the intention I mm -hmm. have and where I'm going. But, uh, well, we've been together for an awful long time, yes. now, since 1964. That's so great. 23 years. Yeah. Can you tell us about your new work, or one you're working on, well, or I've one just, you've just published? I've yeah. just finished a book called... A children's uh, book? Or? A children's book called Lily and the Lost Boy, oh. and that will be published sometime in the next four or five months. I don't... He is, he's not quite sure when. It's a... Uh, Orchard Books under his own imprint, a Richard Jackson book. I think that's Franklin Watt. And uh, I know it is. And he's not quite sure when his line is coming out, but sometime in the next six months. And um, this is set in Greece, and it concerns itself with three children. And I don't know what age group. Uh, the librarians tell me what age group. <laughs> that's right. Your latest published book that I've read was mm -hmm. The Moonlight Man, mm -hmm. published in 1986. Mm -hmm. It's for young adults, as is your American Book Award winner, A Place Apart, mm -hmm. issued in 1980. The father in The Moonlight Man is an alcoholic, mm -hmm. though more intellectual than his counterpart in Blowfish Live in the mm -hmm. Sea, Mr. Felix mm -hmm. I'm referring to. And Blowfish was a National Book Award finalist mm -hmm. published in 1970. Who were the prototypes for these specific fathers? Well, I think, uh, you know, almost in every family I've known, there's an alcoholic lurking somewhere, or potentially, or one, at least almost everybody I've known. Certainly there wasn't my family, my father. Mm -hmm. And, but, you know, it's very interesting. It's, you know, it isn't really one's life. It, it is not the person. Well, when a movie was made of desperate characters, uh, the actress who played in it came over to me and s met my husband and said, oh, you're so-and-so in the book. Well, this is oh. a very... That was Shirley um, MacLaine. Yes. <laughs> That's, I mean, she... But a lot of people are like that. They don't understand that it's, that it's really fictionalized history. And something has to happen to those people in order for them to come through mm -hmm. in books. Otherwise, you're writing autobiography or you're writing case studies, and that's a different yeah. matter. So in a sense, all alcoholics I've known, but I had hoped in The Moonlight Man that he, he had charm, that that charm, mm -hmm. which was a genuine charm, mm -hmm. that he was, a, mm -hmm. that he was a, a lost person who nevertheless had value. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, I mean, alcoholics have one great thing in common, they're drunks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so well Mr. Put. Felix and... Uh, yes. 
-hmm. And Harry Ames were the same that way. You're a one-eyed cat, which I love. Thank you. I'm Has won you many awards. Uh, the Christopher Award, Child Study Association Award, 1985, the Newberry Honor Book, mm -hmm. and 1986, the Ibby Honor Book, mm -hmm. which I had the privilege of picking up your certificate in Tokyo last mm -hmm. summer, Thank you. which you remember. Yes. yes. Uh, what moral values were you stressing in this book? Well, again, it's, it's rather like a question Dr. Weiss asked me, that I, I didn't start out thinking a moral value and then write something to it. Mm -hmm. I felt uh, that book, I was terribly grateful that I was able to write that book because for years I'd been trying to find a way to write about that time of, mm -hmm. of my life and a place where I lived and that minister, although he was nothing like the minister in the book, a little bit like him. And I, th I think... Uh, I think the idea that you really can't forgive yourself until you know that you've done something and that remorse is not the worst feeling that you can have. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea, and, and the idea of responsibility. I, but this, these were all second thoughts after I finished writing it. It just was a very strong book for me, and I'm glad that you like it. Caroline. Well, you used a word I liked, and that's responsibility. Yes. Because Jackie and I wrote in 1987 a book called uh, Values and Selected Children's Books of fiction and fantasy yes. for library publications. And in the chapter on responsibility, we put one-eyed cat well, because we felt that it, it showed uh, Ned Wallace's growing sense of responsibility for old Mr. Scully after he had blinded the, yes. the cat. Exactly. So you see, exactly. We're, we're right on the same yes. uh, wavelength. And it was a kind of freedom. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the way one comes to any kind of freedom which is always conditional, is, is to be responsible, mm -hmm. not the absence of responsibility. That, is, that's right. Yes. Well, what was your primary theme in Blowfish, Live in the Sea? Well, I think the, the mystery of, uh, you know, of one's parents, uh, oh, and being married before, and who were those other people, mm -hmm. and the, the precarious and tender and difficult connection between a half-brother and sister, and the, the, the mystery of that past and whatnot, yeah. you know, and how people manage without straight line lives, but lives, so many children grow up in houses as we know that. But I didn't, again, I didn't set out saying, oh, I must write a book about Another alcoholic father. And, yes. And my uh, 1983 uh, book, prize-winning books for mm -hmm. children published by D.C. Heath's Lexington Books, I interpreted the primary theme of Blowfish Live in the Sea to be father-son reconciliation. Yes, and also that, that which was yeah. very mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. But it was all about... Uh, this is the know. Blowfish book. Mm -hmm. And I think we may only have time to ask another question um, concerning how many uh, miles to Babylon. Yeah. What is the meaning behind this title? Can I get there and back again? Well, I think it has that, that little... It's a nursery rhyme, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It always has a certain menace in it because there's a certain anxiety in it. Can I get there and back again? And I don't know. You know, these things, again, they fly in the window sometimes, like uh, Penicillin and Sir Alexander <laughs> Fleming. You know, they suddenly come, th come through. That's that title seemed to me to be right for it. Well, I thank you. I'm sorry that we've run out of time. Uh, I want to say that in addition to the previously cited awards, Paula Fox has had a number of her contemporary works about uh, personal problems recognized as American Library Association notable books. She won a fiction award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, a writing grant from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts, a Brandeis University Creative Arts Award, and a Rockefeller grant. Her books are known for their gentle, realistic epiphanies, excellent writing style, and rich characterizations. Thank you for Thank being you. our guest. Thank you so much.